so thank you everyone. Uh, so uh, as uh, Professor Bagnia mentioned, I'm a postdoc of the Scientific Machine Learning Lab, and I worked on uh, developing new uh, machine learning methods to solve uh, stiff and uh, hyperbolic PDEs. So um, here's a brief outline of my talk. I'm gonna motivate with a brief introduction and then I will go into more details with the uh, physics informed Gaussian process, how to use that to solve PDEs. And then we'll touch a little bit for the team because uh, Professor Bragunita already uh, gave introduction and then we'll mention a few future work. Okay, um, so we want to develop a, a so-called new numerical methods that can give us some special features. We want it to be meshless. We don't want to be a mesh. We want it to give us the derivative automatically. We also want to uh, have a data-driven basis selections. We don't want to build our basis ourselves. And somehow we also do not want to do time matching anymore. Uh, same way to unify space and time together. And in the same time with all these special features we want, we want to also maintain certain accuracy or certain combination of accuracy and speed. When it's fast, we can lose a little bit of accuracy, but when it's slow, we want to gain more, okay? And also we'll maintain desired uh, features of the solutions. So uh, how can we design these new methods? We looked into the uh, now successful supervised machine learning because it's been really successful in uh, image classification and regression. And if we slap the physical informed property to it, it can act actually do a lot, of, a lot better in prediction. And it also has a strong inverse problem capability. And with the uh, mature GPU computing technologies, we can also go fast. So now we have two successful candidates using machine learning to actually solve or, or even learn PDEs. Uh, the first one is using Gaussian process, and then the second one using the deep neural network. So uh, let's, uh, let me give you some basic example of using Gaussian process to actually solve PDEs. So this is an example using Gaussian process to solve the Icono PDE. So one uh, that being used image processing, it produces a shock uh, square shape uh, images in the middle uh, and using uh, Gaussian process, you can solve it. We solve it actually a pretty good uh, high accuracy with that, okay? You can also solve the uh, Darcy's equation. It's linear uh, PDE, but uh, uh, this is in the divergence form. If you have the uh, permeability coefficient being uh, uh, so rough, so uh, highly oscillatory, you can actually, traditional numerical method will actually have trouble solving it. But if you give it a, fit it to a, a physics informed Gaussian process, you can actually solve it pretty easy with this. You can actually maintain uh, uh, actually a lot higher accuracy with this. So that's two uh, toy example that we try with the uh, physics informed Gaussian process. Uh, uh, and then uh, let's let's dive into the details of how to actually build the solver to solve this. So uh, we can see that we have a PDE on the computational domain, and then we have a certain set of boundary conditions. Uh, for Gaussian process, sadly, we have to consider that the uh, output of TD PDE is actually one dimensional. So we only consider one PDE for now, okay? Uh, we assume that we can actually associate this, this solution space with some kind of uh, reproducing kernel. And then we'll just sample the PDE at uh, discrete points like what we do for pain. And then you can actually recast this uh, solving a PDE problem into finding the minimal element in this reproducing kernel space that actually satisfy the PDEs and the boundary conditions. So it's a, like a, a PD constraint, uh, so what is called a physics informed uh, uh, optimal recovery problem, okay? If you uh, think of this solutions, it's actually a bunch of uh, Gaussian process, and then that the uh, PD operator is just a nonlinear combination of uh, some linear operators, uh, as well as the boundary operators. You can put everything in, and then we cast everything as a linear algebra problem, uh, a constraint minimization problem. Okay, uh, here the, the, the uh, kernel matrix uh, is symmetric, uh, plus a semi-definite, uh, semi-definite due to the numerical noise. Uh, uh, it's actually a little bit, little bit involved to construct. And then the right-hand side is just has all the PD information and boundary information in it. And then the, the Y is just a data back. And then you can actually fit it into any optimization uh, solver and then solve it. And then we construct the Gaussian process solutions at the end, okay? So let's look at an example. This is the uh, nonlinear elliptical PDE. We have the tau being the uh, only nonlinearity in this uh, PDE. And then this is highly oscillatory. So we have different frequency components in both X and Y dimensions. 
And then we think of the first linear operator is just mapping to itself. The second is the Laplacian. And then that's how we construct the uh, PD uh, uh, equations and the boundary uh, operators. And then we only use about a thousand points. So that's another advantage of using a Cartesian process. It's just, you don't need that many uh, collocation points. And here's the setup of the points. We uh, uh, randomly sample all the points inside the computational domain. And then here's just the data on these points, the uh, right-hand side and the boundary data. And here's the solutions. As you can see, we can actually recover not only uh, to a high accuracy, but also the desired uh, properties of these solutions. It has uh, multiple frequency in both X and Y direction. And the uh, solutions can actually get the point Y solutions error can actually get down to 10 to negative four. And they also produce, provide us with the variance so that we can actually do uh, uncertainty quantification for these PDEs. So that's one example. Uh, since tau can be nonlinear or linear, uh, this actually includes Hamhorn's equation as a subset. You can actually use a uh, Gaussian process to solve Hamhorn's equation. And here, as you can see, it can actually recover the uh, highly oscillatory uh, directions in the Y, and you can actually get errors down to even 10 to negative five. It's uh, really amazing with the Gaussian process. Okay, so here's its frequency, we uh, the variance. You can see that uh, it has higher uncertainty in the middle of the domain, and most of it, it, it actually, the solver is pretty certain about the solutions. Okay, so that's, oh, also that's the error. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, that's that. Uh, so now we can solve elliptical PDEs, and you can also use Gaussian process to solve uh, 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 parabolic PDEs. So then we assume that we have this viscous Burgess uh, equation. You have the viscosity in here controlled by the uh, viscosity uniform viscosity term. And, and again, the, here's a setup. Now you have four different linear operators. And this is the uh, PDE equations. This is the boundary equation. And then put everything in, into the Gaussian process. Well, since we have a, a time component and an X component, but we think of the space time as a unity, but uh, in fact, that this is not isometric. So that's why we will use a non-isometric kernel to actually deal with that. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, here's the setup. Uh, and then here's the value. So we have negative sine pi on the initial uh, uh, condition and then everything else is zero. Also inside domain, the right-hand side is also zero. So we, uh, we covered this uh, viscous Burgers equation pretty well up to about 10 to negative two point-wise errors. And here's the variance. So we have a higher, well, uncertainty at the final time, that's for sure, and a little bit higher uncertainty at the initial time by uh, mismatching on the initial conditions. But everywhere else, we get pretty good, um, higher certainty for that. So that's the, that's the examples that we try our Gaussian process on. So as I mentioned, uh, the Gaussian process is really powerful as it requires fewer uh, collocation points as compared to neural network methods and can also give you the variance. You can, uh, uh, such that you can do uncertainty quantification. It's meshless. You can provide derivative. You just differentiate the kernel, so you get the derivative of the solutions. And it's somehow kind of like easier to chain if you pick the right kernel. So that brings up to the disadvantages. If you choose a wrong kernel, basically, no matter how you tune up the points, uh, the method will never converge. So it's highly uh, dependent on the kernel, okay? And the resulting kernel matrix is big and also can become really ill-conditioned as you assemble more points, okay? It can also handle directionally normal and Robin conditions really well, but to handle periodic conditions, you need an extra setup in the algorithm and it will take a lot more time uh, and also an extra uh, pieces of code to actually uh, generalize it to a system of PDE. So we're still working on that. So that's the conclusion on uh, uh, Gaussian process. Uh, and then we can move on to the uh, neural network. We already uh, been introduced to the PIN. So let's uh, look at PIN using PIN to solve a hyperbolic conservation law. So we are not talking about parabolic, we talk about hyperbolic. Uh, um, so we are solving this vis invisible Burgers equation without the viscosity. We only the initial conditions with this uh, uh, initial condition given to us that will provide a reflection to the right, a catching reflections and a shock on the, to the right. So the reflection will eventually catch up to the shock if you don't stop early. 
And then uh, in order to, to solve this equation, we will specify a periodic boundary condition on the limited computational domain. You don't need to do that, okay? Uh, if you try it with baseline ping without any, any additional uh, physical conditions attached to it, uh, the baseline ping will, well, uh, on average, you will never give you a solution, okay? But sometimes you know, due to the uh, random initialization, you might have an initial weight that actually give you a good okay. condition. Uh, and then, if we, we add on the entropy condition, we add the total conservation, we even add the maximum principle to it, and then we can actually solve this hyperbolic PDE. So here's the setup. You can see that we actually can recover the staircase behavior of the two solutions really good, but uh, lacking uh, behind a little bit the magnitude of the shocks, but we can push, uh, we can improve on that. Okay, so we're getting 10 to negative one error from this example. So here's a snapshot of the solutions of the red one is the pink solution, the blue one is two solutions. As you can see, we captured the initial condition really well, even with a sharp transaction. Uh, we like a little bit of the shot as time move on, but we can capture the reflection really well. So yeah, as you uh, add more physical condition to the pink solutions, you can actually capture uh, uh, the hyperbolic uh, conservation law, solution of hyperbolic conservation law. Okay, so that goes, uh, that comes to my conclusion. So. Um, so for future work, so for the uh, Gaussian process, as I mentioned, uh, we have to actually uh, finish the algorithm so that the algorithm can deal with uh, more uh, larger classes of PDEs, such as the system PDEs. And we also want to find a way to actually uh, give us the kernel function from the data so that we don't need to worry about picking the correct kernel function so that the Gaussian process can be used to solve PDEs. And for the pins, uh, we're still looking at how to uh, add more chaining methods or other uh, uh, properties to pins so that it can actually solve uh, stiff PDEs and uh, especially the hyperbolic PDEs, okay? We're still looking at solving, applying pin to solve the other system. Uh, uh, and then uh, we were working a little bit in the radiative transfer equations. We have some demo code ready. And then uh, uh, for the inverse problem, uh, I haven't shown any example of that, but uh, we are still uh, working on this. So uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, questions? Thanks, Ming. Uh, uh, I, 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 I have already seen much of what you presented, but some of it I, I had not seen. <laughs> so maybe we can talk about it later. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that's great. Uh, and any questions from from the audience? Uh, I have a question. Yes. Yes. So this is really exciting. You know, I'm really you know I was I was kind of familiar with what is going on with pins. It's a super active area of research, and you know it's actually very difficult to keep up with the literature. They, they're published, you know, yeah. hundreds of papers every week. With physically informed Gaussian processes. The literature is not as vast as pins, right? No. Now it seems to me that with 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 physically informed Gaussian processes, to a certain extent, you can impose a little bit more of this of a structure, which could be bad or or good, in the machine learning model. By, for example, you could potentially insert, and you can do it with neural networks, right? But you can potent you could potentially insert underlying symmetries, you know, to the problem by manipulating directly the kernel function. Is that correct, Min? Uh, yes, or, yes, that you can do Or, that, yes. or uh -huh. if you know that you have a periodic response in a dynamic system, you can use, you know, a periodic kernel or, or you can engineer, or if you know that a particular, you know, distance in the space that you're trying to model has a particular physical law, you can potentially embed that, you know, physical principle in the kernel function, right? Yes, so, yes. Like, it, like you can actually uh, in, use a green function of a specific PDE as a kernel function so that it can use to solve that specific kind of PDE. So yeah. Uh -huh. So, you know, what do you think? I mean, you know, beans are way more flexible, right? I mean, you can it express is. a lot more. <laughs> it's easy to add a lot of more, yeah. Sometimes freedom may not be that good. So, I mean, what is your feeling? You know, I mean, of course, every one of these physically informed algorithms or frameworks would be better for one type of problem versus the other, right? But what is your feeling in terms of the, you know, side by side? 
are they completely different and you don't have a way to compare them and you say, well, you know, pins are good for one thing, you know, you know, Gaussian, physically informed Gaussian processes are good for other types of problems. And, you know, you have to use a combination of both or both independently to solve problems or do they compare one way or another um, in a more general sense? In my experience, that Gaussian process is really powerful um, for elliptical problems. So right now, for all the, especially the Hemholtz problem, for these elliptical problems, Gaussian process has no trouble solving it for even way fewer points than pain. So, um, and pain somehow is good for parabolic problems, but for hyperbolic, neither of them works. Maybe we can combine them together in a way such that the strength of one can be used to strengthen the weakness of the other. Um, we are working towards that, yeah. Exactly, so uh, we, we, they can be combined, uh, Raimundo, and we are actually um, working on that. We cannot divulge a lot of details yet. Yeah. But, uh, oh, no, I, I can't say we, we are working on that. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, 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 physically, physics-informed Gaussian processes are really under-researched right now because everybody, of course, has moved to neural networks. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, George Karniadakis once uh, said uh, during, uh, you know, he said during a talk that um, they started with Gaussian processes and then they moved on to neural networks, but they didn't move on to neural networks because Gaussian processes didn't work. I mean, they actually worked, but they moved to neural networks anyway. <laughs> so, so no, basically, I mean, I mean, I mean, one advantage of Gaussian processes that you know they need to speed up the uncertainty, right? And if you're trying yes. to do a certain optimization, for example, you know, is extremely valuable, right? Because you can construct policies to try to blame it in certainty and make optimizations. It's hard to hear you now, but but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Gaussian processes as a surrogate model has many attracting attractive features. And um, we are we are going. I mean, you can you can still do uncertainty quantification with neural networks, but it's not as easy. I mean, it it uh, you can use ensembles and other stuff. We're also working on that, but uh, I'm giving away too much today. But uh, yeah, so basically, um, uh, you're right. I mean, Gaussian processes is a, a very open area of of research, and and Ming Ming has a lot of experience with this. He, 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 even in his previous job at Johns Hopkins, he was already uh, working with, the, with this, uh, you know, Gaussian processes, uh, physics informed Gaussian process. So, I mean, we, we, are, we, we are well positioned. And, and I know you are a user, a big user, a big promoter of, of, of Gaussian processes for, for optimal experimental design. And, and you know, we, we, we certainly can, can do a lot. Okay, so 